right, in this video we're going to talk about optical sight quality. And uh, we're going to talk about several different things here. The first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the turret adjustment drums. Now, uh, our primary criteria when we're looking at our, our optical sight parameters here for long-range applications is that the turret adjustment drums are going to have 100% reliable tracking. Doesn't matter how clear the scope is. Doesn't matter how nice it looks, how big your objective lens is, how many uh, neat little hash marks you have in your reticle. If your turret adjustment drums do not have 100% reliable tracking, you, uh, the optic is not going to work for the applications we're talking about. Now, mind you, if you haven't seen the uh, other videos in this series, we're, we're talking about long-range precision shooting where we're going to be making first-round hits at, at really, really long distances. So... In order to accomplish that, the main thing is you want to make sure you don't want your point of impact moving around without your permission. When you dial in your scope, it better be exactly where you put it. And uh, even 97% tracking, that means like it works 97% of the time or with 97% accuracy, that's not going to be adequate for our purposes. And uh, this is going to be the criteria when we're talking about sight quality that's going to disqualify most of the optics we're going to look at, even uh, when we, we've already narrowed it down, we're going to be looking at tactical long-range scopes with target turrets. And even in that category that you're going to find here after we start examining the quality of these uh, different brand names, that uh, a lot of them are very inappropriate for our purposes because the turret adjustment drums are not 100% reliable. And uh, so I'm going to stress that. We're, we're, that's going to be the primary thing we're looking at. If, if the site does not possess those uh, qualities, then it's automatically just ruled out. You cross it off the list, and it's not going to work. The other thing we're going to look at, and it's connected with the turret adjustment drums, is the erector assem assembly quality. That's talking about the internal uh, parts of the scope. You, there's going to be an erector assembly. We talked about this a little bit earlier. But it's a tube on the inside of uh, the scope in which there's uh, erector lenses. And uh, the reticle is usually placed either in the first or the second focal plane within the erector assembly. And uh, actually it is the turret adjustment drums, which are screws, which are basically pressing against that erector assembly and moving it up and down and left and right. And uh, moving those lenses and the orientation of which direction they're pointing in the reticles. And that's what adjusts you know, your up and down and your lateral movement in your scope. And uh, depending on how well that thing is put together is also going to have to do with the tracking, the reliability of the tracking in your scope. So it's not just about the adjustment drums, but they're pressing against that erector assembly. And the materials which the erector assembly is made out of is going to make a big difference. A lot of brands uh, use like polymers or plastics or neoprenes, things like that for some of their erector assembly parts. And uh, some use like brass or steel. And what you're going to notice is that depending on which material you're going to be using for the erector assembly in these different brands, it's going to have huge bearing on the, the tracking of how well these scopes are going to uh, dial in when you're indexing your firing solution. So that basically goes hand in hand with turret adjustments. Another thing we're going to look at is the actual glass within these different scopes. Uh, many people, uh, they hear, heard the terms like ED glass. You know, they, they'll see it advertised for different scopes, or this one uses HD glass. And uh, a lot of folks think that's talking about high definition. You, you know, you think your 1080, uh, you know, high definition t television you can get there. You got all them pixels. That's not what we're talking about with HD. And we're going to explain the difference between achromatic lenses, chromatic lenses, and apple chromatic lenses. And uh, we're going to we're talk about the, how the light uh, goes through the lenses and exactly what's going on there so that you can appreciate what some of these different lenses are accomplishing. We're also going to discuss briefly glass origin and different optics manufacturers. Where do these lenses come from? Are American uh, scope companies, do they actually make their own glass? Uh, a lot of guys like to, uh, you know, they, they'll find certain scopes and they'll say, oh, that doesn't have near as good a glass as this one because that's not American. Well, we're going to actually uh, take a little bit of a look at this. We're not going to get too much in depth, but uh, you might be uh, a little bit surprised at some of the origins of a lot of these uh, different types of glass from these different companies. So we're going to talk about uh, glass outsourcing. 
uh, quality control uh, and, and apply it to the different brand names. We're going to talk about like Leopold, Nikon, USO, all the different uh, brand names. Uh, we're we're going to really briefly mention reticles again and the quality of that and the overall construction quality. Like uh, the adjustment turret tracking reliability again is huge. It has a lot to do with machining and assembly. So just the overall construction quality of the scope, everything has to be perfectly put together in order for it to work properly. Like we said in the video before this one, we've been concentrating on optical sight parameters in terms of features. And as we've seen, for, for our purposes, your scope is going to have to have the exact right features in order for it to be even somewhat effective. And the other half of it, obviously, is that if it's going to have those features, those features are going to have to actually work for you. So that's where the quality comes in. Just having the feature alone is not enough. The feature has to work. So we're going to definitely look at that. And that has to do with a lot with how the scope is put together. Uh, the assembly process is huge. And, and you can make some judgments based on where it was assembled, too, because there are overall differences in uh, worksmanship quality when you go to different regions where some of these things are assembled. And we'll just briefly talk about that. And then we're going to talk about ruggedness of the different optics. We're going to look at different brands. And we're going to make judgments on ruggedness based on past experiences and also based upon like field tests and uh, military selection and just uh, features and which ones are more uh, prone to be more uh, rugged and which ones are not as rugged. And uh, after we're done uh, discussing our glass types, we can look at these different brands and discuss optical clarity between the brands and uh, different things like this. So let's get started here. Uh, let me look at my little sheet here. Okay, we got a potential long-range optical sights compared. Now on this graph here, you're going to notice that we got on the, the left-hand column going down, we got different uh, makes, and these are brand names here, and I got them in alphabetical order. Now there's a bazillion different rifle scopes out there that would probably be marketed as long-range tactical scopes. What I tried to do here is I just tried to consolidate uh, some of the real uh, popular brand names that a lot of people ask about and are curious about, and which you'll find in most stores. And uh, I've kind of, for the model, I've, I've tried to select like the representative model of each one of these uh, different uh, brands that would be appropriate for applications. So like, for example, on the Burris scope, I chose the Extreme Tactical because that's kind of their scope that they're marketing for our purposes. So I'm not going to go choose their turkey hunting scope or something like that, right? So uh, I try to choose the best optic. Uh, or the most uh, typical representation of their long-range precision rifle optic here. And, uh, of course, uh, these uh, different conclusions we're going to draw, um, These we're not trying to basically slam any brand names because this is going to be very dependent also on the model. As I'm sure most of you are aware, different brands have different lines of models, you know, and you can find some real expensive scopes. Like, for example, Leopold makes all different... Uh, um, you know, price ranges and stuff like that. You can buy scopes for $170 all the way up to a couple thousand, you know, when we're talking about Leopold. So it's going to depend a lot on the different model number too, you know. So these aren't uh, carved in stone by any means, but this is just a basic matrix we're going to uh, construct to try to help us kind of sort through all the confusing deals. And this is just a comparison deal. This is not trying to actually quantify any like quality values, but it's just comparative, okay? Now, as you'll see, we'll have these different uh, scopes and models here on the left, and on the, the different columns are labeled. We got uh, turret tracking. That's our primary criteria like we talked about before, and uh, we have assigned letter grades, kind of like you'd get if you went to school, and uh, F would be like a failing grade. A would be like really good. B is pretty good. C is going to work fine. That's a passing grade. D is like, oh, man, you need improvement. And F is a bad deal. So, uh, and again, this is uh, not set in stone, but it's just we're getting a basic idea. Now, uh, I'm grading pretty tough on these optics. For our extreme range applications, minor differences matter a lot, especially in the quality of certain features. So uh, just because I didn't give a scope... 
uh, a rating of A, for example, in a certain category, it doesn't mean it's not good. It just means that it's not the absolute best. So the ones with a, a grade of A represent like the very, very best. A grade of a B is still very good, but it's not like the top of the line. So let's briefly introduce you to these different columns real quick, and then we'll go back and kind of go through each one. The first one, as we said before, was the reliable turret tracking. This is the big one. If you, this is kind of if you only could look at one column, this is the one you want to pay attention to. Reliable tracking. Your scope has to have that. If it doesn't have that, then you don't want it. That's uh, the main criteria. It's it's not glass clarity. But most of these scopes are going to have just fine clarity for all practical purposes. There are differences in clarity, but that's not how we're we're uh, grading these. Because if you think about it, who cares how clearly you can see if uh, when you dial in the optic, it's going to not hit where you're pointing. So the turret tracking is the big deal. The next column is internal build quality. And this is talking about the interior parts of the scope, just how well things are put together, what materials they may have used, and how well everything meshes together and operates. These long-range tactical scopes are very, very precise instruments. And everything needs to click right and uh, dial in right. And your alignment has to be absolutely perfect. You kind of want this to be put together like a well-made Swiss watch or something. So uh, that's with any uh, precise instrument, but particularly in these optics. And that's represented here by these internal build quality column. Uh, optical clarity is the next one we have on the list. Uh, Although it's not the most important thing, it's still pretty important. Uh, you do want to be able to see your target more clearly, especially if you plan on having an optic with high magnification. As we talked about before, a lot of guys think that uh, you know a high magnification scope is kind of the ticket. But then uh, they uh, get the scope and they dial it up to the maximum power setting and they'll notice it actually seems more blurry than it was on the low power setting. And that's because you're zooming in on optical imperfections in the glass. So if you want high magnification capability in your scope, like over 10 power, you're definitely going to have to pay attention to optical clarity. And unless you're, uh, and we'll talk about the lenses here in a minute, but unless you're planning on getting some pretty premium lenses, you don't want to mess around with high magnification because it's not going to help you very much. Uh, the next column is overall ruggedness. That's going to have a lot to do with the materials of construction again. And also, it's going to be a combination of that and the, the features that are in the scope and the complexity of the scope. So that's kind of a more, this is all more dynamic than we can just list in the chart. Uh, the next column is general quality score. And that's going to kind of take an overall average of the grade of the overall quality. And the other column you might be seeing there, that's the feature score. And I'll show you probably in the next video. We're going to run through practicing actually selecting scopes from this list. And we're going to try to show you how we got that feature score. But that's the different features. If the scope actually has the features in the first place, um, that was the score there. So let's just uh, work our way down the line and look at these different uh, brands and models. And try to get an idea of the quality that these different uh, models are going to have. Uh, I was looking for the, the Barska scope that a lot of people would probably try to use. And I found the tactical rifle scope. It's called just the Barska tactical. And uh, this is a one inch tube. And it's a three to three to 12 variable. Mill dot reticle first focal plane. And it has the one quarter inch uh, adjustments for windage and elevation. We gave this a feature score of a C because uh, that's not uh, not really a bad uh, combination of features. It didn't have a perfect score because, you know, the one-inch tube, that's kind of a check mark against it there. That, uh, you, you're going to want a larger tube for long-range applications. You're going to want a bigger range of uh, elevation adjustment in there. Also, we, uh, one thing we considered here, that the magnification was fine because it was in the first focal plane, so that is a desirable feature. Uh, you know, if you have a variable power magnification, you do have to have a first focal plane. So that checked out okay. We didn't have any demerits there. Um, mill dot reticle is good, um, but we notice here uh, minutes of angle, okay? So you our uh, units of measurement on our elevation and windage adjustment are in minutes of angle, and our reticle is a mill dot. So we have 
milliradians as one system of angular measurement in our reticle, and we have minutes of angle as the system of measurement on our knobs. And that's not a desirable feature, so that did uh, remove a couple points there. So our overall feature score was a C. So that's not bad. That'll work. The features on the, bars, the Barska tactical rifle scope are fine. They're not like super good, but the, a C is not a bad grade. Um, now, if we look at the uh, potential long-range optical sights compared for quality, we're going to find some problems. Okay, we do have the big uh, target knobs on the scope, but those, the tracking on these Barskas, and this is with most of these budget optics that are built for sporting purposes, they're not going to be offering the, the reliability of tracking that we're going to need. Now, it's true you might be able to kind of dial it in, and it'll pretty much go where you want it to, but pretty much is not going to cut it at extreme range. So this one failed the test. The Barska is not going to give you the degree of uh, turret tracking reliability that we are going to find to be essential for long-range uh, target interdiction. So that got an F in that quality. So that basically rules this one out automatically right there. You can pretty much cross the Barska off the list just from that one. But just to go on, the internal build quality is quite poor on the Barskas. I do like them for other applications. They might be fine for a lot of sporting applications or even, uh, you know, if, if you don't plan on dialing back and forth a lot. But for our applications, like I said before, we're shooting long range. So when we're talking about the alignment of the different lenses and the tolerances in the erector tube assembly and how everything slides back and forth in the variable optics, it has to be very precisely put together at extreme ranges because a tiny amount of uh, play in there is going to give you a huge point of impact shift. So if it's not really, really well put together, it's going to fail. So that's why it got an F. I'm not saying it's getting an F for other applications. This might work just fine for medium range shooting where you're not adjusting your turrets or where slight changes in magnification are not going to affect your point of impact by enough to miss. But for long range applications, it was a failure. Optical clarity is actually not too bad in the bar skit. It passes the test there. That It ain't bad. Um, now, there's a lot that are way better, obviously, but really, like we talked about before, and we'll talk about this when we talk about uh, glass, and actually, this is a good place to talk about glass, and we'll come back to this. Most of the rifle scopes you've probably uh, grown up with use what is called achromatic glass. Now, there's actually, we're going to talk about three different types of lenses here, okay? And uh, we're going to talk about chromatic glass acrochromatic glass and apochromatic glass and uh, most modern rifle optics use achromatic glass let's look at the first chart here if you just look at a chromatic lens where you have one uh, just one piece of uh, glass for a lens this would be a standard lens this is pretty much not used anymore uh, most modern scopes use a better kind of lens but you'll notice that when light strikes a lens at a straight angle it is uh, refracted inside the lens. When light goes from the air, the atmosphere, and it goes into uh, something with a lot higher density, uh, plastic or, or the uh, glass, a lot of it's not really true glass. Some of it's plastic, especially in the, in the cheaper uh, lenses. But uh, that's going to have a different refractive index than the air. So the light's going to change directions once it hits that. And you know that glass bends when it hits light, right? Like a prism, it, it, uh, it bends the light. And it's going to separate your different colors out. And uh, you're going to have three different uh, main wavelengths going on. You're going to have your reds, which is a real low um, frequency, and they're kind of a long wavelength on there. And you're going to have your greens, which is a, a little bit uh, shorter of a wavelength, a little higher frequency. And then your blues, and your blues are going to have a real high frequency and a short, short wavelength. It's going to be real, you know, high energy wave. And uh, depending on the type of glass, the, what exact recipe of chemistry is used in that glass and the shape of the lens, that's all going to determine how those different, uh, if you just shoot white light into a lens, it's going to determine how the, those colors split up, okay? And uh, what you'll find in just a standard chromatic lens is you have uh, chromatic aberration, and basically what that means, if you look at my little pictures I drew here on paint the other day again, see, I'm, I'm becoming quite the paint artist, as you can see. But you'll notice, and this is called chromatic aberration. 
uh, the different colors are going to be separated and they're not going to come to the same exact focal point. And the result is you're going to have an image that looks kind of goofy and blurry depending on which part you're focused on with your eyeball, wh wherever that uh, focal point is going to be. So uh, your different colors are going to separate out. It's more than just, uh, you know, someone says, who cares what color the target is? Well, that's not really the deal because you're going to have kind of a blurry effect if you have the reds uh, focusing in on one point and you're going to have a different focal point for the blues and the greens. It's going to appear kind of fuzzy in, in some ways. And uh, so what most uh, modern uh, optics manufacturers have uh, figured out a long time ago is that if you arrange a couple of different lenses, a, a, a flint lens and a crown lens in a certain fashion like we show here illustrated, that you can actually bring the two different uh, wavelengths, uh, usually like red and blue, and you can at least get those two to focus in in the same plane. And that uh, basically limits the effects of the chromatic and spherical aberrations, the way these uh, lenses are arranged. So odds are, if you've got a modern rifle scope made in the last 25 years or whatever, and you pick it up, the objective lens and your lenses are going to be uh, achromatic lenses, which are corrected to uh, bring the red and blues into focus in the same plane. Now, the green's going to be off by, its, by itself over there still. It's not going to be uh, brought into focus in the same uh, focal plane here. So it's still going to have a little bit of... Uh, goofy what we call chromatic aberration which is basically it's not going to be a perfectly clear image uh, but it's a lot better than it used to be now if you're uh, really wanting the very best in quality and you have a lot of money in your pocket you might get one of these real premium scopes that's going to offer what they call um, HD glass or uh, ED and we're talking about the fluorite or APO glasses high density glasses now, HD, now, although some uh, manufacturers have just decided to advertise HD as high-definition glass, the real term there is high-density glass. And what we have here, and this is the apochromatic lens setup. We actually have three different pieces of glass here, and uh, all your different colors are going to be brought into the same focus points. So now, your blues, your reds, and your greens are all coming into focus in the same plane. And uh, they're, they're bringing the three separate wavelengths into focus. And this is where you get really, really sharp images with perfect color correction. And, like, uh, again, we're not talking about just color, but this has to do with optical clarity, okay? You might have color fringing at a high contrast edges, you know, like an edges between black and white, and it might get kind of goofy, uh, you know, fuzziness in there. There's different optical terms that guys will use in the business to kind of explain that effect. But uh, basically, this is going to give you that super crisp image. But typically speaking, if you have any given scope model and you are going to somehow upgrade it to this uh, HD glass, the, the high-density type glasses uh, with the, or the apochromatic setup, you're going to pay a couple hundred bucks, maybe even five or six or seven hundred dollars more than uh, the model would have been just to have these lenses. They're extremely difficult to manufacture. Um, there's a lot of uh, fancy uh, chemistry going into these. For example, uh, you know, some of these high-end flint glass pieces are going to have like titanium dioxide or zirconium dioxide. And there's a lot of uh, engineering that goes into optics and uh, getting that light to bend where you want it to bend. It's uh, quite the complex uh, field in physics there is optics. So... There's a lot of work and, and time and sweat and blood and tears that went into figuring all this stuff out for these guys. So uh, when you pay the big money on the big fancy scopes with the real good glass, uh, that's what we're talking about, apochromatic. You got all your color correction being done there. So uh, depending on which uh, uh, refractive index they want to give to these different glasses, they're going to introduce different chemicals and things like that into the compounds and get the composition to change so that the dispersion of the light is different. And uh, so if you see like uh, the term ED glass, if you see that advertised, that's talking about these apochromatically corrected lenses and uh, or APO that just apochromatic is what that means. Uh, some guys call this like a fluoride glass because uh, uh, fluoride is just a, it's a it's a class of non oxide optical glasses, basically, 
and they use fluorides of different kinds of metals to get like a heavy metal fluoride glass. Uh, HMFG is another term you might hear, but it, it makes for real good optics, uh, particularly of uh, these higher quality lenses. So if you look at some of your real, real premium optics, they're going to be your APO uh, lenses, your apochromatically corrected lenses. And those are going to be the most desirable ones for in terms of optical clarity. So where do these different uh, lenses come from? What's the origin of them? And uh, this is an interesting topic. A lot of folks get kind of patriotic when they're uh, doing their scope shopping. And they want to make sure that they're buying scopes that are American-made. And American-made stuff generally does have pretty good uh, quality. But, as I'm sure most of you probably realize, that even if you buy something that is uh, American-made, you know, like an American company, like if you buy like a Ford car or something, or if you buy a Chevy down at the dealership, uh, a lot of that stuff is actually made in Asia shipped over and then assembled in America. And a lot of that stuff is not actually made in America anymore. Um, it's just that we've lost a lot of our manufacturing base. And uh, so that's just the way it works. Even though it might be an American brand name doesn't necessarily mean it's actually made in America. And um, it's kind of the job of advertisers a lot of times to cover that fact up because they know people do prefer especially Americans, you know, uh, those of us in America here, we prefer to buy stuff made in America. So advertisers will try to kind of almost twist it a little bit sometimes and uh, try to make it seem like their stuff is made in America. Um, growing up and uh, doing a lot of hunting and stuff, and, you know, you talk to a lot of different deer hunters and elk hunters, a lot of guys are very, very uh, motivated to buy certain brands because they seem like they're fulfilling their patriotic duty kind of. And uh, it's interesting because of all these different scope manufacturers, hardly any of them want to admit the truth. And I'll just tell you the truth straight out here. Pretty much there's no such thing as American-made lenses anymore. Uh, that's a thing of the past. Uh, we've lost our manufacturing base on lenses. Most scope companies in the world outsource uh, their lenses, they have Asia build them. Most of the stuff's made in China now. Uh, Philippines, uh, Japan for some of the real good quality stuff. But uh, there's only like one proprietary uh, optics manufacturer I can even think of that actually attempts to make their own glass in America. It's just uh, too expensive to, to build it in America, I guess. They just didn't, they thought they could save money or make more money if they outsourced to China. Now, the good news is really that the uh, uh, technology has advanced to the point to where even China can make pretty good quality glass uh, because most of this being done on the computer and it's all being done by machines. So it kind of depends on uh, e which exact factory over in China or Taiwan or wherever you're looking at is, uh, you know, how, how close their quality control is, how strict, uh, you know, they, uh, how, how, what kind of tolerances they got going on. And, and a lot of it goes into the polishing and uh, some of the American companies do kind of do their own custom uh, lens designs and stuff like that. And they send over the specifications to these Asian contractors and they build them. Uh, and then uh, they, they get them back to the, to the specifications in which they've designed. So you got to watch the advertising very closely as they designed in America. Well, that's true, but it wasn't made here. And uh, what generally happens, and this doesn't really matter what brand name you're looking at but for the most part this stuff is made in asia okay and uh, these parts and particularly the lenses are all made in various factories and any given scope uh company whether it be a leopold or barska or any of these uh you know all, all the all your favorite american scope companies even they kind of contract out to these Asian companies and whoever makes the best deal that month kind of gets to sell their lenses to these companies. And uh, it's interesting because Leopold was actually one of the only companies I could find that was honest about this. And I'm going to read you something here because you might be thinking I'm full of it right now. But uh, this is from uh, www.leopold.com about us American Optics Authority. This is straight from their own website and I'm just going to read it verbatim. I'll post it up here too. Leopold uses 
foreign source components for some parts of the Golden Ring products, primarily lenses. This is because at this time, there is no American manufacturer that can supply the quantity of high quality lenses that Leopold needs for its annual Golden Ring optics production. Leopold's lens systems are designed at Leopold by American optical engineers in its state of the art uh, or in its state of the art optics lab and then procured from outside vendors who must meet stringent quality standards. Incoming parts are carefully inspected in our testing facility before they are accepted into the assembly process. Incidentally, all major optics producers worldwide acquire some or all of their glass from the same sources as Leopold. Some of these sources are located domestically. Some are European and some are Asian. Uh, Leopold has acquired its lenses this way for over 50 years. Okay, that's straight from, straight from Leopold. And uh, there's basically... You can highlight the Asian part because that's just the fact of where these optics factories are. Very rarely are they going to be European glass or uh, or from anywhere else. So I, I was qu quite impressed. Leopold was quite honest about it, and they just put it right out there. So I think there's a lot of rumors going around. Oh, Leopold's are Chinese glass. Leopold's like, well, yeah, you know, pretty much everyone uses the same glass we do. So... uh. There's been some interesting topics that have come up. A lot of guys, when they're arguing about scopes, like we talked about before, uh, our, our primary criteria is going to, for our purposes is actually the turrets and the erector assembly and the tracking. But a lot of hunters and stuff are uh, very, very concerned with optical quality. And uh, the idea has been that, you know, if you don't buy a Leopold, if, if you get a Tasco or something, that, oh, man, Tasco's glass is not as good as Leopold's. It's not made by Leopold, and that's not how it works. The Tasco glass and Leopold glass could very well have come from the exact same factory. Uh, so this stuff is all made in various plants in Asia. And what they do is they make this huge pile of lenses over in Asia, and they go through, and Leopold kind of picks through the pile of those lenses, you know, and uh, they pick out for uh, their different price ranges. Okay, this lens meets this set of specifications. This is good enough for our Golden Ring series. So they take them and they put them in there. Another company might come to that same pile of lenses and sort through it and say, okay, this uh, lens is good for Tasco or this one is good for NC Star or whatever scope company you're talking about. So a lot of the crit criticisms of some of these optics, like a lot of guys really don't like the SWFA scope. Because uh, they've heard that, oh man, Tasco was the company that was in charge of putting that thing together. So therefore, it's a Tasco scope. Everyone knows that Tasco has terrible, terrible quality lenses. And so one of these other uh, higher quality scope manufacturers would be better. And the funny thing is, they're all from the same place. And that's just the brutal truth. I don't know how else to put it. Now, uh, there are, like I said, there is... There is uh, some other places that do make glass, some of it, some of the European glass is actually made in Europe, which is kind of, it, it's funny because a lot of the European glass, there are certain European uh, manufacturers that uh, really play it like, yep, this is um, made in Germany or whatever. And uh, it's not, it's uh, actually the lenses were made in Taiwan and you bought them and inspected them and then you assembled them in Europe. So uh, that's just kind of how this goes. It changes from month to month. So trying to keep track of who makes what is like almost impossible nowadays. There are a couple companies that do have really, really, they, they do pretty much everything in-house. Uh, one of them is uh, U.S. Optics. And that's actually the only scope manufacturer I can think of where pretty much everything is made in the United States. And I'm pretty sure that they actually do make their lenses here. Um, so that's the one, if you want an American-made scope, a truly American-made scope, U.S. Optics is the one to go for. And that's a Tier 1 scope. There's not really anything better than that. Uh, Schmidt & Bender would be equal with U.S. Optics in a lot of terms. Schmidt & Bender glass does seem to be maybe a tiny bit more clear than uh, U.S. Optics. Schmidt & Bender is a G German glass, and that's actually uh, made in Germany. They're one of the German uh, scope companies that I know 
Uh, they do make their glass there. Uh, they do have a plant in Budapest. And uh, if you're looking for the, the highest quality glass possible, uh, Schmidt & Bender's pretty much right on the pinnacle there. U.S. Optics, very close. Uh, U.S. Optics and Schmidt & Bender are pretty much, uh, they, they tie overall. Uh, they, they do have different things. Schmidt and Bender might, uh, uh, U.S. Optics might be a little more rugged than Schmidt and Bender, but they're pretty close. They're, they're hard to compare. Another real, real high quality uh, glass that you'll find is uh, Night Force. It's not as good as uh, U.S. Optics or Schmidt and Bender, but uh, Night Force does use Japanese glass, which is actually pretty good stuff. Uh, and again, it's quality control. They sort through the pile and find out uh, which glass that they, uh, <laughs> that's going to be suitable for, for their scopes. And uh, Night Force glass is really good, actually. So uh, another one made in Japan. I think a lot of Nikon scopes are ma are Jap use Japanese glass. And like I said before, I mean, they outsource to the highest bidder. So, I mean, there's no, like, real straight answer a guy can really give because, like I said, it changes all the time. But I do believe a lot of Nikon oh stuff is usually made in Japan. Uh, IOR Valdata, that's a, that's a European scope company. That stuff, I believe, is European. But a lot of the other European scope companies are surprisingly, they outsource to China and, uh, and these other uh, Asian Pacific Rim places and stuff like this for their glass. So they're just as guilty as anyone else. But there are those two companies on the very top that I mentioned that actually do have very, very strict uh, control over their products in every step of manufacture. That's U.S. Optics and Schmidt and Benders right on the top. And like uh, pretty much all your other stuff, only God knows where it came from. Uh, but uh, it's the different companies' uh, ability to sort through the pile and pick out the stuff and do their own quality control. So when we're examining the uh, and comparing the optical clarity of these different manufacturers, you need to keep that in mind that it basically has to do with quality control and not so much origin of where these lenses came from because nobody really knows the origin on pretty much most of these uh, uh, scope companies. So let's look back at the chart here, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about these things as they pop up. But uh, the Barska, we said it had an F in turret tracking, so it's pretty much not going to be... The optical clarity is fine. The overall ruggedness is not so good on the Barska. They do tend to kind of fall apart on a guy if you've ever actually used them a bunch. Um, so we're going to give it a general quality score of a D, which is poor. It's not very good. That's not going to work. Don't. I would not recommend buying a Barska. If you're looking for a, a, a budget optic that's going to be cheap but still work, I'll give you a very good recommendation here at the very end of the optics videos where I'm going to give you different price ranges and uh, the best optic within those price ranges for our purposes. Let's quickly look at BSA. I, p I picked uh, the mil dot rifle scope. That's what it's called as a representative of theirs. Uh, this one basically sports uh, one inch tube again, so that's not very desirable. A, a 30 millimeter would have been better. It is a 4 to 16, so they do have the variable power, but it's in the second focal plane. So that really, that sucks. That's not very good. And also it has a mil dot reticle and minutes of angle adjustment. So that's also not desirable. So the feature score on the BSA has got a really poor selection of features. So that failed. Uh, basically, the features are not going to be very good for our applications. On top of that, if we look over here at the quality the uh, the turret tracking is going to fail. BSA is not going to have any kind of reliable turret tracking uh, for, for our purposes for long range where you're going to have to actually be counting the clicks. Um, internal build quality for our purposes is not going to work for what we're using it for. Optical clarity is uh, pretty shaky last time I checked. I've had a few BSAs and uh, they might work, like I said before, I'm not trying to slam these scopes if you own them. But for extreme range shooting, no, that's just not going to work. I don't know how to be nice about it. Overall ruggedness, oh, man. I've had objective lenses pop out of the front of them when I've shot. These things like to fall apart. I'm sorry. Uh, general score, that thing, do not, no, BSA, that's not an option for, for our purposes, okay? They look cool sitting on the shelf, and when you strap them on your gun in the living room, it might look nice looking across the street or whatever, but when you sh when you use these things, you'll find out what I'm talking about. 
you'll be very disappointed. You should have saved your money and got something a little different. 